as the church replaced Israel. I'll give away the ending at the start of this review. No, the church has not replaced Israel. And Michael Vlaches, as the church replaced Israel, provides the reader with a strong presentation of the arguments used for why many Christians believe the church has replaced Israel, also known as supersessionism. The history of that view, plus the hermeneutic and theological presuppositions that undergird the view. Then he shows why replacement theology, this view that he builds up and shows why many believe it to be true, why it fails when measured against sound hermeneutics and a quality study of the passages of the Bible used to support it. This is a really great book. The biggest problem, though, for many people is going to be found right on the cover. It's the title. Because a growing number of supersessionists today cry foul at the use of replacement language in describing their view. In fact, when I read Kingdom Come by Sam Storms several years ago, he actually, by the end of that book, had me leaning a little bit in the direction of amillennialism for a while. And I was strongly considering adopting his view of not what he called replacement theology, but fulfillment theology. The church hasn't replaced Israel, you see, but the church is the fulfillment of the promises made to Israel. So the big question is, does Michael Vlach fail in his book in its very title before one even opens it up and begins to read? Is he arguing against a straw man that most in the church have already rejected? And people don't even really hold to the view of a replacement theology today. Well, let's talk about the title of this book, Replacement Theology, and why this book is still important now, even while men like Sam Storms and others claim to reject replacement theology for themselves. Welcome to Rev Reads. If you want to discover more books that will help you to be a wise student of the Word of God, please subscribe to the channel in order to stay up to date with the most current reviews. And also, please like this video, share it with other people to help them know about the great work that's done by Michael Vlach. And I also want to say a huge thank you to the Buy Me A Coffee members whose support allows me to cover the costs of putting these reviews out with Rev Reads. And I would love you, if you enjoy this channel, if you benefit from the reviews, they help you find new books that you wouldn't have known about without the channel, I would love for you to consider supporting Rev Reads at a beginning support amount of only $3 a month. Now, when I first saw this book, I thought, man, I don't think this is going to have nearly the use or the impact that it probably should have. Because those who are in the replacement theology camp have been leaving the title behind. They've been leaving behind that word replaced for a while now. Although maybe with the recent uptick in anti-Semitism around the globe, maybe the word replaced will make a comeback. But those who believe the church has fulfilled the promises made to Israel since believing Israel was the church all along. They're going to see this book and they're going to call foul, that's wrong, when Vlach writes a book with replaced in the title. So the question is, should that complaint stick? Is it a valid complaint to say that you shouldn't call it replacement theology and that Michael Vlach is arguing against a boogeyman? Now, I would say that the first three pages in the introduction chapter to this book are the most important because it's in those pages where Vlach argues, and I believe rightly, that whether you call it fulfillment theology or replacement theology, the results are exactly the same. Not only are the results the same, but if someone who believes in a future restoration of Israel, most commonly found among dispensationalists today, we will use the same arguments to argue against fulfillment theologians as we will to argue against replacement theologians. Why will we use the same arguments? Because both groups, replacement 
and fulfillment use the same passages and make the same arguments to reach their views that come to the same exact conclusion, showing us that there's really no difference between replacement and fulfillment theology. As an illustration, I grew up in Binghamton, New York, which at one time was the home to the Onondaga Native Americans. But as we know in, Euro in American history, the European settlers, they moved into Binghamton as they did pretty much everywhere across America, and they drove the Onondaga natives, of, um, natives out. The European settlers came in, replaced the Native Americans, and settled in that land. The change of replacement theology to fulfillment theology would be like saying, the European settlers didn't replace the Onondagan Native Americans, but those settlers are the fulfillment of the Onondagans. And the land and the Binghamtonians today, they're the true Native Americans that are living in this land right now. Now that's nonsense, and everybody knows it to be. Changing the name of replacement theology to fulfillment theology is much the same. It sounds nicer, but it's the same old view. Now, much of this book is written to define and present the arguments of those who support fulfillment theology. And I thought Michael Vlach did an admirable, admirable job at fairly presenting the views of the opposition to the point where at times I got a little frustrated because... I'm somebody who's really against supersessionism, and I don't really enjoy quality presentations of those views because I think they don't align with scripture at all. So at times, it was frustrating to see such a well-written presentation of their views. But once the reader hits chapter 13, and then going through the end of the book, Michael Vlach's writings on evaluating the theological arguments of supersessionism, God's future plan for all the nations, and his two-part case for the restoration of national Israel, those chapters are pretty much worth their weight in gold. I highlighted so many paragraphs toward the end of this book that at times my highlighting was kind of pointless because they were basically covering the entire page, and I'm not someone who highlights that often normally. His evaluations in this book are logically sound, biblically based, and he shows how so often the supersessionist view just takes a very superficial view of the passage that is in controversy and simply inserts a replacement or a removal of Israel where it's just not actually there. I especially loved this line in the book. If the church inherits the new covenant in Israel's place, then it could be expected that both the spiritual and physical blessings of the new covenant will be applied to the church, but they are not. Only the spiritual blessings of the new covenant are applied to the church by the New Testament. So Vlach makes this strong argument that in the church we are included in the benefits of the new covenant, but that doesn't mean that we replace Israel any more than our inclusion in the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant, because Abraham was to be a blessing to all the nations, that that in some way would cause us to replace Abraham, or we would fulfill all of it in us, and it wouldn't be fulfilled in him. His chapter on the future for the nations was especially helpful and also shows the importance of the millennial kingdom in an understanding of God's plans and especially his future plan for Israel and even the nations. In the future, it is clear that there will continue to be nations even in the end times. Multiple prophecies speak of a church with ethnic distinctions and nationalities of people who will come to worship God in the millennial kingdom and also in the eternal state. And if God is going to make all the nations a part of his kingdom, and even so in the new earth, to the point where you'll have Egyptians and Assyrians coming and bringing their praise to the Lord, why would God do away with the nation of Israel, but at the same time highlight the other individual Gentile nations? So if Israel is a nation, which it was, it was a country just like all other nations with a king and with citizens, the logical view is that God will fulfill all those promises made to Israel in the Old Testament that we're still waiting to see become a reality after the return of Jesus Christ. And there'll be multiple nations during that time period, and one of them will be Israel. A straightforward reading of the Bible while holding to replacement theology 
would entail that Jesus will have a place for the various nations of the world in his kingdom, and the one nation that will be left out because it was replaced is Israel. And that just doesn't make much sense in the overall narrative of Scripture. Vlach ends the book by looking at multiple passages in the New Testament that confirm that God does still have plans for Israel. They have not been set aside and forgotten or replaced by the church. In multiple passages, such as Romans 9-11 through 11 and Revelation 7 and 21, Israel and the church continue to exist distinct from one another in the New Testament. So we have passages that don't just speak of the church alone or Israel alone, but we have passages where there are Israel and then the church, Israel and then the multitude side by side, and Israel is still an ethnic designation for the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then we have in the eternal state with the new Jerusalem, there are the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles who are represented as the foundation stones and the gates of that city. And so we see even in the very final passage of the Bible, we maintain a distinction between Israel and the church. This is a book that I highly recommend for anyone who is wondering, where does Israel fit in God's plans for today? and his plans for eternity? And how does the church relate to Israel and those plans? So this is a great work by Michael Vlach that I hope is read by many today, even those who think that replacement theology is something no one believes today because it's been replaced by fulfillment theology.